Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 27th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, why a recent op-ed by Senator Shelley Hughes and others actually convinces us to vote yes on Prop 1. Second, like others from the top 20%, Representative Jennifer Johnston seems to be running on both sides of the fence just to keep in power. And third, how John Coghill's APOC report tells us a lot about the strength of his primary opponent's, Rob Myers' challenge. And now, let's join Michael. Some interesting stuff today. Uh, that we're going to dive into. And uh, first and foremost, something that will probably surprise a lot of people. For those of you who don't know, uh, Brad is a former oil and gas consultant and attorney. And so he's got some ties to the industry, some history there. Uh, He had talked originally about Proposition 1, which is Alaska's fair share, the uh, oil tax initiative, uh, as being detrimental to uh, the, uh, you know, to the state overall and problematic uh, and uh, he's pointed out some of the, the problems with it, but he has changed his mind, maybe not for the reasons you think, but he says Shelley Hughes has convinced him to support Proposition 1. Uh, that's going to be number one on our weekly top three this morning. Good morning, Brad. Uh, what what happened? <laughs> well, Michael, a few weeks ago, you'll recall that, that Shelley and uh, Mia Costello and Mike Prox from Fairbanks uh, wrote an op-ed that ran statewide that, that argued about uh, that, that focused on the on on Prop One and said Prop One was necessary uh, to preserve the PFD. You you and I talked about it at the time, and and basically their argument was we have to have ongoing development, we have to have ongoing revenues um, uh, in, in order to have revenues that 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 you know uh, 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 build the PFD and produce additional earnings uh, in the future. What we talked about at the time was that Shelley, Mia, and and Mike didn't discuss how to preserve the PFD in the meantime. Uh, it was all about it was all about you know somewhere down the road when all this investment will result in additional production and additional revenues. That's what's going to be necessary to preserve the PFD. But we're facing a situation right now uh, where we don't where we have two point a two point three billion dollar deficit that we're staring in the uh, in the face. And we don't have uh, uh, we don't have alternative revenues to fill that, and so people are are you know thinking that they're going to use the PFD to fill it, and and you have to eliminate the PFD. You have to use all of the PFD in order to to even remotely get close to to filling that sort of deficit. And Shelley and and Mia and Mike didn't address that issue at all. Uh, if we don't address that issue issue, how do you fill the deficit and preserve the PFD? Uh, if we don't fill that issue, there's no PFD in the future to worry about because because the PFD will be gone. It will have long since been eliminated, swallowed up into government, uh, and once it goes, I think I think it's realistic to think it never comes back. So that that really triggered me to, to, to start diving in deeper. Uh, on how are we going to fill this hole? How are we going to fill the $2.3 billion deficit? I've talked a lot about uh, a flat tax in the past. I'm still an advocate of the flat tax to fill part of it. I've talked about PFD restructuring uh, to go to a 50-50 POMB, which I think is more consistent with Governor Hammond's original intent uh, than the current statutory formula. That helps fill part of it. 
but the but the deficit is so big that we still need more revenues uh, uh, in order to in order to fill the deficit. Cutting cutting spending, let's say we cut spending by five hundred million dollars. We've never done that uh, on the operating budget, which is what we're confronting now. But let's say we cut it by five hundred million dollars. We still have a deficit even after uh, PFD restructuring and even after uh, uh, something of a flat something of a flat tax. So, so we need additional revenues to, to save the PFD now, substitute revenues uh, to save the PFD now. And, that's, and, and, and it, was, it was Shelley and Mia's and Mike's argument that triggered me to focus on the fact, how are we going to save it, save it now? In fact, we discussed it that day, that day the show that we discussed, uh, that we discussed their piece. And I've come to the conclusion that one piece of that, it's not, it's not the only thing, it's not, it's not, it's not going to be the cavalry that comes over the hill that be completely. But one piece of that is what's built into, into Prop 1. A lot of what you hear about Prop 1 and a lot of the doomsday scenarios you hear about Prop 1 out of the oil industry are based on looking at Prop 1 uh, if we have $60 oil. Well, we don't have $60 oil. Right. And looking, looking at the futures chart, we don't have $60 oil any time in this decade. We're in the 30s, 40s, 50s, um, and so a lot of this, a lot of this doomsday scenario that you see coming out of, coming out of oil, and, and indeed you saw it in a, in a KTVA, a Channel 11 uh, uh, article that they did yesterday. A lot of these doomsday scenarios are are based upon oil prices that we're not going to get to. On the same, by the same token, a lot of the claims made by the Prop 1 boosters that, that it's going to result in an additional billion dollars, that's also based on $60 oil, $60 plus oil. So we're not, we're not going to get to those revenue levels uh, either. At the, at, the, at, at the prices we're at, uh, at, uh, at the $37 uh, that's projected uh, by, uh, uh, by revenue this year, we'll bring in about, oh, let's see, I did the... I did it here at. Uh, oh, it, we'll bring in about 200. We'll bring in about uh, 90, 128 million dollars, 130 million dollars uh, at 37 dollars. If, if if oil gets up to 45 dollars, which it's flirting with, um, assuming we don't have a a, a second dip uh, as a result of what's going on with uh, with the renewed COVID problems, if it gets to 45 dollars, that'll raise 250 million dollars. So it'll raise something. Um, and 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 it will it will contribute toward uh, the deficit. What does it do on the oil side? Well, it raises costs about three percent, overall costs, uh, the, the, their costs of of doing business, uh, capital costs, uh, operate their operating costs, uh, transportation costs. It raises it about three percent at forty five dollar oil. Now that's that's three percent. That's not that's not nothing. But it's not the doomsday scenario that, that, that oil's been talking about, people from oil have been talking about at $60 an oil, $60 a barrel. So going back to Shelley Hughes, when, she, when, when they wrote that article and said, we've got we've to you know, uh, defeat Prop 1 to, save, to save, uh, save the PFD, what that triggered was, okay, fine, I understand your argument about the future, but how are you saving it now? And the article didn't discuss that. Their op-ed didn't discuss that at all. They just sort of skipped over that. So diving into how do you save it now is going to take a combination of things, um, uh, uh, PFD restructuring, uh, spending cuts, you know, sizable spending cuts of, of some part, some sort of personal uh, responsibility on the part of Alaskans to help pay for government equitably. Uh, I think that's a flat tax. Others may think it's other forms, but but some some personal responsibility on the part of Alaskans to pay for their government in an equitable fashion, and some contribution from oil, which under Prop One uh, gets us about another 250 million dollars if we if we average out at 45 dollars. There's one other piece of this, Michael, and that's we've got a fail we've got a fail safe. When we passed Aces, Aces was an overreach at the oil prices that we fell into. Uh, under aces, we, we we went under we went to hundred dollar oil, uh, and the and the tax burden was was significantly different, I think, than what people anticipated at the time aces was passed. We redid that with SB twenty one. We restructured it for the times we were in with with uh, SB twenty one, and that's produced a benefit. It's 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 maintained investment and maintained production um, uh, during a period that 
that oil prices were were higher than they are now, but 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 moderately moderately higher. Um, now that we're in a low price environment, we can we we can adopt uh, 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 Prop One, get some revenues out of it, not unduly burden the industry. But the fail safe is, is after two years, the legislature can if if oil prices have have, have escalated, if somehow there's something that we didn't see uh, in Prop One uh, that causing problems in two years, the legislature can come back and fix it. So we have a fail safe. The problem is we can't come back and, and fix the PFD. We've, we've, got to, we've got to get the PFD fixed now, or the PFD is going to be gone. So it's really come down to how to get revenue, alternative revenues in to support government, even with spending. How do you get alternative revenues in to support to support government not taking all of the PFD? Um, and I think probably plays a role in the oil price the scenario that we that we have now and we see in front of us. It's not it's not a huge burden, uh, not the doomsday burden certainly, but not even a huge burden that we're imposing on the industry to uh, 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 to, to help contribute toward uh, toward that solution. Well, and we you and I talked about this previously when Prop One first came about. Is you said, look, there's there's probably some wiggle room here on things that you know that there should be an increase in taxes, maybe not to the amount that Prop One pushes, but you talked about maybe two or three hundred million dollars on the table. Uh, you know, that that probably could be done because Alaskans deserve to receive uh, the maximum benefit. That's what the Constitution says for their natural resources. And that there was probably some wiggle room here. Maybe this wasn't it. Uh, But you're saying now that the long term uh, bad effects of Prop 1 can be mitigated uh, because they're they're a longer stretch than this short term issue of budget deficits and everything else. Yeah, I think so. And and what what I was talking about at the time in 2017, when Congress changed the corporate the corporate income tax rate, um, uh, significant change to the corporate income tax rate, significant drop in the corporate income tax rate, the benefit of that drop went in went mostly to industry. There was a piece of it that came to Alaskans, but most of it to industry. And the way we've historically sort of approached this is is the federal government takes a share. The state takes a share, and the producers take a share uh, of the revenues, uh, uh, the, the profits that, that come from uh, come from the development of oil. The, fed, the feds take their share through the corporate income tax, um, and and so when the corporate income tax dropped, you would expect that a portion of that benefit would come back uh, both to Alaskans and to and to the companies. It didn't. The way it was structured, it came back mostly. Uh, mostly to the companies, so there, there's been this sort of this sort of hanging issue out there uh, that, frankly, I expected the legislature to address at some point, but but they haven't. Um, this is this is an entirely different way of getting at generating some additional revenues from from the industry. It's not comparable to fixing the corporate income tax uh, issue, uh, but again, when you look at at these oil prices. Uh, at these oil prices, and I stress that because that's an important consideration. At these oil prices, when you look at the impact uh, on industry costs uh, from Prop One, it's just not that big. Uh, I mean, two hundred fifty million dollars at forty-five dollar oil is is, is two hundred fifty million dollars, but it's just not that big. It's about three percent of their overall cost. So, I it's 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 dependent uh, on the oil price. Um, uh, but but it is at this oil price what we're dealing with now, and 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 frankly, this oil price is part of the part of the reason we've got a problem in the first place with our budget. Uh, at this oil price, I think it's a I think it's a, a a step that we can take to get the industry to contribute to, to overall costs. People who say uh, it, it's come down to this for me in, in discussions I've had with friends in the industry, people who say, oh no, industry can't stand any more costs. Well. So what you're saying is Alaska families have to stay in the cost. I mean, somebody's got to pay. Even after you cut government down, let's say $500 million, somebody's got to pay for that deficit. So if, if you and the industry are saying, I can't stand any more costs, what you're saying is Alaska families have to stand the cost. And if you then say, as many in the, as many in the, the vote no on one movement do, well, just take it out of the PFD, what you're really saying is – Industry doesn't want to pay, so middle and lower income Alaska families have to pay. Right, uh, and that's just that, that. To me, is an outrageous position. Right, I mean, it's it's it, we're all in this together. 
uh, uh, not only do middle and lower income Alaska families have to pay some through PFD restructuring, but upper income, the top 20 percent of Alaska families, should pay, should contribute some to the cost of government. We've all done this together. We've all pushed these, this spending up together. Um, uh, Alaska government has to pay some of the cost by taking, by taking a, a reduction um, uh, in spending levels. And the industry can and should be part of the solution uh, at the oil prices uh, that we are currently. Prop one's not perfect. I mean, if we get back up to 60 or $70 oil, it's horrible. Uh, but, but Prop 1 is a way for the, for the industry to contribute. And frankly, it's the only way on the table right now for the industry to contribute. One other thing, one other thing that I think is important. I learned a political lesson back in, back in the early 1980s. That's, that's sort of ancient history for a lot of people who are listening to this. But I was, I was young, and I was sitting in uh, Billy Tozan's office on Capitol Hill, a congressman from Louisiana, uh, who was a Democrat then, became a Republican later. Um, and we were talking about changes that, that needed to be made to the Natural Gas Policy Act of 1976, if you can believe that. And, and Tozan, Tozan was saying, well, we're going to make this set of changes now, and we'll get to the other set of changes. We'll do these other things uh, uh, later on. And, and I sat there, and I was going, mm, this doesn't sound right. Uh, and lo and behold, what happened was they made the, set of, they made the changes to the things that were not important to my client. Uh, the other set of things were important to my client. They made the set of changes in Congress that were important to some, uh, and they never got around to the changes right. that were my, that were important to my client. And I and I learned the lesson then of divide and delay, divide, delay, and kill. Actually, uh, which is divide the question, get past what what some people want, uh, delay what 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 is related, but other but but you, ultimately but kill it. Yeah, it, it isn't immediate, and then and then kill it later on. Yeah, uh, and that's that's sort of what's going on here. That's that's as I reread Shelley's Shelley uh, Shelley's op-ed, it struck me again. This is divide, delay, and kill. It is, it is. Don't vote for uh, vote no on Prop One because because it's got long-term effects. We'll get to the PFD, uh, but then they we'll get to the current PFD, but then they never do. Right. So the only thing on the table right now is Prop One, and I and I think we ought to we ought to take advantage of it while it's there. A couple of good questions popped up here uh, that I want to get to, um, and uh, I want to ask this one. This is the second one, but I'll ask it first because it's right here. Uh, Kelly asks in the chat room, Brad, doesn't Prop One mean with lower prices on oil, how could producers sustain an additional cost? Isn't it cheaper for them to produce in the lower forty-eight? How can we compete? Would that be the last nail and send them packing up on the North Slope? How devastating would that be? That's a good question for you to start with. Oh, three percent, three percent isn't going to send them packing. The, 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 they've got they've got a, a significant amount of investment up here. They've got they've identified new opportunities, um, and, and the rocks aren't going anyplace. Um, there's going to be delays in investment up here, but it's not going to be because of Prop One. It's going to be because of depressed oil prices, uh, and and a three percent increase in cost is not going to be the trigger uh, that sends them running south. Now, if we were at sixty dollar oil or seventy dollar oil, and we were talking about significantly higher percentage increases as a result of Prop One, uh, that might be a that might be a different issue. But but at forty five dollar oil and a three percent increase in cost, we're not we're not going to send the producers packing south. They're gonna they're gonna complain. They're gonna they're gonna they're gonna raise a bunch of arguments that are built around sixty dollar oil. If you look at if you look at what Scott Jepson said in the in the interview with KTVA uh, that's that's captured in yesterday's article, all those arguments are built around sixty dollar oil. Uh, and they're going to complain about it, and they're going to they're going to you know talk about the the parade of horribles that are out there, and they are there are a parade of horribles at sixty and seventy eight dollar oil, but at forty five dollar oil and a three percent impact, uh, it's not going to it's not going to push them south. Uh, Charlie asks, Brad talks about the top twenty percent not wanting to pay for services, and how taking the PFD penalizes lower income folks. However, the lower income folks use police, EMT, Medicaid, other community services uh, at a much higher rate shouldn't they pay for what they use well a i don't know that i've never seen any any data that shows that they use police or emt or 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 other uh services at a at a much higher rate if there is data out there i uh, i i'd love to see it charlie if you want to send it to me uh but i certainly have never seen any data that that that, that establishes that but even if you assume the lower 20% do use more government services. Even if you assume that, 
the PFD, cutting the PFD is worse than a flat tax, is worse for for 80%. It's worse for not only the lower income, but the but the the lower middle income, the middle income, and the upper middle income. The only ones it's better for is the top 20%. So even if you assume the lower 20%, lowest 20% uh, use uh, use government services, those government services more. Certainly that's not true of, of of lower middle middle and and certainly not true of upper middle. Yet they're being penalized. They're being charged more. Uh, under under the the PFD as well, there more costs are being shifted to them uh, uh, using PFD cuts than uh, uh, than, uh, uh, than than a flat tax. So it, even if you assume that there's that there's this you know in, that there's this rough offset of additional services down in the down in the uh, down in the lower twenty uh, percent, you're still penalizing middle income, upper middle income, and lower uh, uh, middle income uh, Alaska families uh, through PFD cuts. Uh, Rob says, our biggest competition these days is not the foreign producers, but the domestic shale guys. Since the federal tax restructuring affects North Dakota and the other shale producers, as well as the producers here on the slope, wouldn't we still be putting ourselves at a disadvantage? Well, it, it's three percent, folks. I mean, at, at these oil prices, it's 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 three percent. If if you think three percent is going to trigger uh, a flood of investment south, uh, my thirty five years in the industry tells you would say that that you're wrong about that. Uh, you can believe it, uh, but I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's correct. And the alternative the alternative is to push those costs that we otherwise would recover from the industry is to push those costs. On middle and lower income Alaska families, um, and I just I don't think that's fair. Uh, I I think that in this environment, in this in this price environment, given the 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 impact, uh, the the relatively soft impact of what uh, Prop One would have on uh, on producers, I think it's fair to ask the uh, uh, the oil producers to to contribute. Uh, I'm just looking through all the comments here. Fake conservatives. Uh, we won't tax the people. We'll tax the corporations. Everybody, of no, course, no, we're taxing all of them. Yeah, we're, that's that's just absolutely wrong, absolutely wrong. Prop one does tax the oil companies. That's correct, but we're still taxing middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. PFD cuts are taxes. They are they are the diversion of private sector income to government. That's the classic, it's the classic definition of of, of a tax. And and we are taxing Alaska families. We're taxing them heavily. Even after Prop One, we're taxing them more heavily than we're than we're taxing the companies. So it's it's wrong to say we're going to tax the companies and not and not Alaskans. We are taxing Alaskans. We aren't taxing them equitably. We aren't spreading the burden across all Alaska families. We're asking middle and lower income Alaska families to pay much more, which has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. Fair share is liberal. Maybe Brad is our rhino. Anyone ever heard him say anything core conservative? I don't know. Have you listened to this program? I mean, have you heard him talk about smaller, more limited government? Have you talked to him about, I mean, uh, you know, I just, I don't even know if that necessarily is dignifiable with a response, but I'll let you respond, Brad, because. Well, Michael, I mean, I mean, here's the deal. I mean, people, people don't like taxes. I get it. I don't like taxes. I mean, I was I wrote an op-ed in 2012 when people were were still uh, and it's in the Anchorage Daily News. If anybody wants to go look it up, when people were still arguing for spend more money on this, spend more money on that, I was in 2012. I said, wait, we're spending way too much. We're going to send ourselves into a deficit. The PFD is going to be at risk. Taxes are going to be at risk. You know, people laughed at me at the time, but but that's I mean, I've been out there on this. I understand people. I understand people don't like taxes, but that's the reality we have come to. We are we are facing current law, current statute, current PFD statute. We're facing a two point three billion dollar deficit. That's fifty percent of the budget. We're not going to cut our way out of that. We're not going to cut two point three billion dollars in spending. Anybody who believes that needs to you know go listen to some other program instead of me because they're just not dealing in reality. Uh, there, there are going to be taxes. The question is, who are taxes going to fall on? I understand, you know, people who are in the oil industry don't want it to fall on them. I understand people who are in the top 20 percent don't want it to fall on them. I understand the people in the in the middle and lower income Alaska families don't want it to fall on them. But it's got to fall somebody. The, the revenue has got to come from someplace, and and getting 
a, a, a little bit, a balanced approach of a little bit from PFD restructuring, a little bit from the top 20 percent top 20% by using a flat tax or something that raises revenues equitably across all Alaska families, not just middle and lower income Alaska families, and some from the industry under under the circumstances that we're at now at $45 oil, which prop, where Prop 1 doesn't hurt the industry that much, a little bit is is, is, is a way, to, and, and, then, and then quite a bit of cutting, that's a way to resolve this. People who say, well, no taxes here, no taxes there, no taxes there, they're just not dealing in reality. They're not. They're not focusing on the on the deficit we've got and what it's going to take to 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 to, to deal with that deficit. Uh, one of the commenters just said, "Oh well, yes, give them more money, and of course, then they'll save the PFD." No, 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 no more spending. Uh, but you know, again, the argument that you're going to give them more money, they're just going to spend that as well. What say you to that? Well, no, that's not true. I mean, spending is going to be. We, we, we've hit the limits of spending. Nobody's going to be increasing spending. The question is, how are we going to pay for the for the deficit, the two point three billion dollar deficit we've got? Yeah, you, even before you, you even before you start worrying about additional spending. So it it, it the, the question is, how are you going to pay for that? And 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 it's do you want it to come entirely from the PFD? Those that want it to come entirely from the PFD, you probably should stop listening to me because I'm never going to agree to that. That has cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. This is ICER. This isn't me. Largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy is the most equitable, the most hurtful to to middle and lower income Alaska families. So you're never going to hear cut. You're never going to hear eliminate the PFD from me. If if we don't if we don't eliminate the PFD, if we try to retain the the, the some semblance of the PFD, the revenues have to come from somewhere. Um, and even even if you cut five hundred million dollars, the, the additional revenues have to come from somewhere. So that that's call it a tax, call it a revenue contribution, call it whatever you want, but it's got to come from somewhere. And all I'm saying is is under the circumstances we find ourselves now, forty five dollar oil prop one is not a bad way to have industry contribute a portion of it. We could probably go uh, on about this thing the the whole the whole show today. Uh, but we're not. We're going to move on to number two, which is the top 20% trying to hedge their bets. They're trying to continue to hold on to their power. Uh, case in point is Jennifer Johnston, who uh, put out a mailer here recently, which even Jeff Landfield over at the Alaska Landmine, who, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, the guy's the guy's kind of a douche. But he he uh, he even he saw the uh, the uh, hypocrisy in this mailer. Uh, but for you, Brad, it's just a it's just a uh, uh, an example of how the top twenty percent are trying to hold on to that power. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So Jennifer Johnson puts out this mailer. Um, it, it, we, we seem to be on a string of mailers. Last week it was Kathy Geisel's. This week's this week's is Jennifer Johnson's. Jennifer Johnson puts out a mailer uh, that says, "Vote for her so that Republicans can take back the House." Now this is Jennifer Johnson, who's co-chair of finance. In the in the Democrat Republican in the in in the in the two party uh, 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 majority that that currently rules the House, the Bryce Edgman Edgman majority that currently rules the House, Jennifer Johnson, co-chair of finance, part part of leadership of that uh, of that uh, uh, Bryce Edgman led uh, coalition, saying vote for her so the Republicans can take back the House. She's already a Republican, uh, and but yet she went over to the to the to the other side. What, what this what this is what this strikes me as is the top 20 percent and Jennifer represents the wealthiest district in the state Natasha is the wealthiest legislator in the state but Jennifer represents the wealthiest uh, house district in the state uh, and what this is is the top 20 percent uh, trying to play both sides against the middle you know she's a member of, of the leadership of the of the Bryce Edgman led uh, uh, majority she's co-chair of finance she's got her Got her fingers on the on the on the pulse over there, and and she's hedging her bet by saying, "Well, you know, if the Republicans take control, I want to be part of that majority too." Basically, what it is is the top twenty percent wants to be in control wherever control is. Right. If that control is going to be over with Bryce Edgman, they'll be over with Bryce Edgman. If that controls with the Republicans, they want to be over with the Republicans. They just want to be in control. And why did they want to be in control? Because they want to control how. We pay for this deficit uh, that uh, the governments run up uh, over over the over the last eight years. Now that we're out of now that we're out of savings, they want to control how uh, we pay for this deficit. 
Um, and and they and, and it doesn't matter if they're over if they have to join that the Bryce Edgman led uh, majority or if or if they're or if the Republicans take back control they just want to be in control um, and they want to and 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 the results of their control is to uh, is to use PFD cuts to uh, uh, to fund government to push the burden off on middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. So it's I, it, it is to me it's the it's the sort of the height of of hypocrisy. You know, it's not I'm not running on principle. Basically, uh, Jennifer is saying I'm running to be in control wherever control is. Right. Uh, and right. and and you know keep the top twenty percent there and keep keep us in control uh, of both the purse strings as well as uh, as deciding uh, how, what revenues we use to fill the hole. Well, yeah, I mean she basically is saying I'll go wherever the steering wheel is. You show me the steering wheel, that's where I want to be. Uh, the other thing I found interesting in this mailer is he said, Jennifer has the experience at advocating for reduced government spending, uh, which, <laughs> which uh, again, her track record is definitely not that of a of a budget hawk. Uh, she had an opportunity when Governor Dunleavy put his original proposal down. And she was the one uh, she was one of the ones that was pushing, uh, you know, back against that as well. Uh, I don't think that her uh, I don't think her her experience at advocating for reduced government spending is that great. Well, she has experience in advocating for reduced government spending on the campaign trail. <laughs> right, right. Sort of, like, sort of like Giesel. I mean, Giesel has experience in advocating for the PFD on the campaign trail. But when you get them down to Juno, there's they're, they're something else. Uh, they go on in an entirely opposite direction. Jennifer's been part of this cabal with the, with the, with the Democrats to sort of, you know, don't touch my thing, I won't touch yours. In, 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 in the case of that majority, it's don't cut spending, say the Democrats, uh, and, 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 and in return, the top 20 percent Republicans who are over part of that majority say, don't, don't, uh, don't tax us, cut the PFD in order to pay for that spending, because that dodges uh, taxing the top 20 percent. And so it's, it's, it, she, she talks a lot on the campaign trail. I used to have a lot of respect for Jennifer, but it, it's all gone now. She, she talks a lot on the campaign trail about uh, about you know being a Republican and Republican values and, and and reducing costs and she'll even talk about spending caps. Of course, they're tied to spending; they're not tied to revenues. But she'll even talk about spending caps. Uh, but when she gets down to Juno, you know, it's just something else entirely. James Kaufman, if you really want a Republican in that in that, James Kaufman is much better much the better uh, alternative as opposed to somebody like Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think he's got some good support going on there. Ironically enough, uh, pointed out by the landmine, I thought it was pretty funny, was that Tom McKay, who's running against Jennifer Johnson's good buddy Chuck Kopp, also sent out a mailer that says take back the House to ensure conservative Republican leadership, underlined conservative Republican leadership in Juno. And I thought that was hysterical because – uh, you know, you got one of these mailers that's really kind of uh, running the truth, and the other mailer, which is again the height of hypocrisy. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, uh, it, it's I, the, 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 basically between last week's Geisel mailer and this week's Johnston mailer, what we what we've learned is is the 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 top twenty percent will go to whatever length it takes to say whatever they need to say on the campaign trail to adopt whatever they think their constituents want to hear to that will make them vote for them they'll 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 go down that road but when they get to Juno they're there's something else entirely and and voters need to be pressed not uh, not only on what the candidates are saying but what the candidates are doing uh, once they go down to Juno because in some cases uh, both Kathy and Jennifer's case, it's something entirely different from what they're saying on the campaign trail. Well, and I think uh, really, uh, interestingly enough, Landfield really hits it here when he says, uh, you know, that that uh, you know that she's she's facing this uh, this whole take back the house thing. Uh, it'll be interesting because Chuck Cop, also a member of the House uh, majority uh, in this coalition majority, uh, is part of the problem, and 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 he's saying that Jennifer Johnson seems to be hoping. That her her constituents just aren't paying attention. That they're maybe just being confused. That you know, instead of defending and explaining her decision to join with the Democrats, uh, he's just hoping that they're just not uh, paying enough attention. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, that 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 they're that they're paying attention to the words and the mailers, as opposed to the actuality. Chuck Cop's another one. I mean, Chuck Cop uh, is comes from the second uh, most wealthiest district uh, in the state. And is another one who's just sort of running on on, 
you know, just just elect me, and I'll and I'll look out for you. Uh, and I'll do what. Here, here's whatever I need to say to get elected, and then I'll go down to Juno and I'll make sure yeah. that, that we continue these policies that protect the top twenty percent. Barbara Haney says he's attacking Johnson. WTF? And I ask her, "You're a fan of Jennifer?" He says, "I barely know her, but she has not been at round long enough to blame for Alaska's fiscal problems." Your guest has. Uh, to which I say. Wow, Jennifer Johnson is part of the problem, Barbara. I don't think that you've been paying close enough attention. If that's the case, Barbara, I mean, excuse me, Jennifer is the one that uh, joined with the minority, uh, or excuse me, with the, yeah, the minority Democrats to form this coalition. And she was a big part of taking the PFD and increasing the size and scope of government. So I don't know what more you need. I mean, how many more years of that do you need before you start going, this is probably not the gal for us? Uh, so, I mean, this is not an attack on Jennifer. This is pointing out the hypocrisy of her point. I mean, going back again to that mailer saying, take back the house. It, uh, it, it really, uh, uh, is surprising to me. Well, was Jennifer there? I mean, let's focus on Barbara's point for a second. Was Jennifer there during the spending run up? No, she was on the Anchorage, uh, uh, assembly, uh, during that period. She wasn't in the house. She ran in 2012 against Kathy Giesel for the Senate lost, uh, and then uh, uh, was on the Anchorage Assembly at the time, and continued on the Anchorage Assembly uh, after that until she until she, until she joined the House. So she was she was one of the issues in the Anchorage Assembly. But here, but so so she wasn't there during the run up in cost. But here's the here here's the issue when when the rubber has met the road, when we have run out of uh, savings, uh, and and now we're down to how are we going to pay for this government we've built up? Jennifer has been at the forefront of those who have said, take the PFD. Um, Originally, she said, take part of the PFD. Uh, They had a bill, uh, House Finance had a bill that was going to restructure the PFD to cut the PFD down to 25% of POMB. And they pulled even when they figured out that that the deficit was going to be bigger than that and they needed to take the whole PFD. That was Jennifer. So Jennifer may not have been part of the problem of running up costs, but Jennifer certainly has been part of the a key part of the problem of using the PFD, uh, taking the PFD to uh, to pay for those costs. The third of our weekly top three has to do with that race in the interior. John Coghill, of course, the incumbent, uh, who uh, who really hasn't had a serious challenger in a long, long time, but his actions have spurred some people on, and Rob Myers joined the fray. And uh, uh, Brad says that uh, some people see Rob Myers as this year's uh, Ron Gillum in the Ron Gillum versus Machiki race, which almost uh, unseated Machiki last year. Uh, uh, Brad, give us some insight into this after looking at those APOC reports. Well, there's some really interesting information in the uh, in the APOC reports. I mean, there's interesting information in in all of the campaigns. The the amount of cross ties you see. Uh, Kathy Giesel giving to, to some member and then some member giving back to, to Kathy Giesel. Um, uh, there's a lot of interesting information in the APOC reports that I think uh, uh, are, are relevant and, and maybe we'll talk about on next week's show. But one of the most interesting uh, was looking at, jo- at uh, 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 John Coghill's APOC report and looking at who contributed to him. And there was there were a number of PACs in there. Um, some labor packs, but a number of packs in there that were uh, that were surprising. But one really stood out. NEA, National Education Association, their pack gave John a thousand dollars. Now, now, why is that interesting? It's because John John's not only facing a primary; he's facing a general election uh, run against an independent candidate, Marna Sanford, who's currently on the Fairbanks. Uh, it's either the borough or the city council, I can never remember which, um, but is is on one of those councils, is is fairly liberal uh, in, from from the perspective of, of how Alaska looks at things. Um, and, and you would expect, and I expect we will see in that general election, NEA uh, and others uh, backing Marna against John. So why are they giving John a thousand? Why is NEA giving John a thousand dollars now, leading up uh, leading up to the primary? A thousand dollars is nothing to sneeze at. That'll that'll buy you some mailers. It'll buy you some some billboards and and uh, and and buy you some radio ads. So it's it's why are they why are they, why is NEA backing uh, John now? And I think I think what some people are thinking, and I and I suspect is people 
who's looked at polling data like NEA, what some people are, are thinking is, hmm, this race is shaping up to be a repeat of the Ron Gillum, Peter Machecki case, or P Peter Machecki uh, primary, uh, Senate primary from two years ago, where Ron came within a hair's breadth uh, of, uh, of defeating, uh, defeating Peter. You know, a few votes here and there, and Ron would have been the Senate nominee instead of, instead of Peter. And I think, I think some are beginning to see uh, the prospect of, of Rob's run against John uh, sort of falling into that same pattern with, 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 again, with people who I suspect are looking at polling data, seeing Rob, uh, Rob moving up against John and are, and are you know, backing in. Why would John take money? from the NEA. Right. I mean, some candidates, some candidates sort of, you know, are careful about who they take money, uh, take money from, take what, what packs they take money from, or, you know, whether they take money from Kathy Giesel or, or others. Why would John take money from the NEA? Um, knowing that, knowing that, you know, Marna is going to be out there and the NEA is likely going to back her. He would do it because he's concerned because he's seeing data also that indicates Rob is moving up. So, if I were gonna if I were gonna pick one race this year, where I think uh, I think there's a potential for a surprise to the to the establishment, there would be some in Anchorage, but I think I think uh, the the APOC reports are telling us that uh, that the, uh, the the Rob Myers uh, John Coghill race is uh, is shaping up to be one of those as well. Uh, the uh... The overall, and of course, that race is uh, is going to be very interesting. And I have watched, uh, uh, you know, I've watched this with great interest because John has run unopposed for so long. And as I've talked about, there's been a there's been kind of a, a metamorphosis over the years of John standing up in the very beginning, not joining the binding caucus, not doing these things, taking a stand. And over the course of several years, he finally joined. Was offered a leadership position joined the House, uh, eventually migrated over to the Senate, and really has become one of the things that we were fighting uh, uh, against uh, from the very beginning. Um, and and I think you're right. I think this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, is people who have power want to do anything to hold on to it, uh, you know, probably for the best of reasons, probably believes he's doing the right thing, probably believes he understands this better than most regular people, and so that's why he needs to stay there. Uh, Rob jumping into the race, uh, I think, offers us a good opportunity to see that sea change. I know you've supported Rob uh, from, uh, you know, from, uh, the, you know, this kind of race from the beginning, as you've supported many candidates around the state who are bucking the status quo and pushing back against the people who would take the PFD and uh, not reduce the size and scope of government. Yeah, and I and I think Rob's one of those. I mean, you know, just just think back two years ago. Uh, you know, people didn't give Ron Gillum much of a chance against Peter Machecki. Peter Machecki was the establishment. He had all the money. He was, you know, he was he was a former mayor. Uh, he was he was well known, high profile in that district. Uh, uh, even had uh, thoughts about running for governor. Um, and and you know, people were uh, people didn't give Ron much of a chance. But Ron got the message out about the PFD, and Ron got the message out about looking for frankly, looking out for frankly, middle and lower income Alaska families, working Alaska families, uh, and did a very good job of uh, of getting that message out. Um, and I've seen I've seen many of the same characteristics in Rob as I've sort of watched him and watched that race and watched what he said and watched how he's developed. Uh, I, I see a lot of similarities, but. Doing so, if people are looking for a candidate that 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 the talk and a candidate out there and looking for the things that that people on this show say they hold dear, uh, lowering government, lowering government costs, and, and reducing the tax burden. Uh, uh, and again, PFD tax, PFD cuts are a tax. We are paying taxes in this state, reducing the tax burden, finding a more equitable way to, to spread that burden. If people are looking for a candidate to, to accomplish that, uh, I think uh, I think giving Rob a very hard look is, it would be a good thing to do at this point. Uh, we're talking with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. And really, those APOC reports are very telling across the board. I mean, if you look at who is being contributed and like Kathy Giesel contributing to the races of basically – her lieutenants around the state. I mean, she's trying to maintain control. Uh, you know, these the ones that are in power, like Jennifer Johnson and everything, they want to remain in control. And I guess my biggest question is this: uh, when you look at this and you and you and you see these things, 
you know, doing the same thing over and over again is and expecting different results is the definition of insanity. And if these folks didn't have the foresight in the action that they've taken over the last 10 to 15 years, depending on how long they've been in there, what th- what makes you think that they have the insight to come out of this problem that they didn't even foresee that they were creating when some of us called it early on? Yeah, exactly right. And, 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 and you're right about these APOC reports. I mean, so Kathy's given to John. I mean, basically what you're seeing, what you're seeing is a race in, on the Senate side is a race to, to retain Giesel or to, or to vote Giesel out. And it's not just the Giesel race where this is happening. It's, you know, Kathy's given to John. John is given to Kathy. Um, and, and so, you, so you're, you're seeing these ties. When you look at the APOC reports, you're seeing these ties. A vote for John is actually a vote for Kathy. So if people in in that district, in the North Pole District, want to retain Kathy Giesel, if they think it's a good thing to retain Kathy Giesel, vote for John, because that's what the APOC report's telling you that uh, telling you that where the where the support is. But if you think you think it's it's a good it, it would be a good thing to change the direction of the Senate to get to get another uh, leadership structure in the Senate, uh, don't vote for John, because what what John's telling you through the APOC report is he's going to back Kathy. Uh, all the way, and the NEA is backing him uh, all the way against Rob, at least, and uh, and and you know that's that's the direction it's going. So, I, I the, the takeaway from this is Rob Myers, uh, I think, has a chance. I think the APOC report is telling you the other other side knows he has a chance, um, and that and that if you're if you really want to change things, um, yes, if you're in Kathy Giesel's district, vote against, vote for. Uh, somebody other than Kathy. But if you're in John's district, vote for somebody, uh, vote for Rob Myers uh, instead of John. And if you're looking for somebody to support uh, that can that can change things, Rob Myers is a good is a good place to look. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, I'm going to give you the floor here for the last 90 seconds or so uh, to, uh, you know, to defend yourself uh, just for a bit here, because, you know, again, you've raised a lot of angst in the chat room today. Over your top three things, you know, the proposals on, uh, you know, voting for Prop 1 and, uh, uh, you know, pointing out uh, some of the hypocrisy in the, in the leadership. And somebody said you're, you're fomenting class warfare, talking about the top 20 percent and everything else. I want to give you a chance to sound off and, and you know, summate why you're talking about the things you're talking about, why we've had you on the program for the last five, six years uh, to discuss these things and just kind of your position on it overall. My position is the Alaska economies and uh, the Alaska economy and Alaska families first. What we ought to be concerned about in this state is is promoting and protecting Alaska families. We ought to be concerned about promoting and protecting the Alaska economy. The ICER 2016 study says it all. It says cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact of all the options, has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and on Alaska families. And, and, and the ITEF 20, uh, 2017 study says the only, fam- the only in- income segment that benefits from PFD cuts versus, uh, versus other alternatives uh, is the top 20%. So it's, it, it's really been clear that to protect Alaska families and protect the Alaska economy, we need to protect the PFD. To protect the PFD, we need to reduce the, the, the level of cuts. Uh, that are being taken out of the Protect Alaska Families, Protect the Alaska Economy, we, we need to reduce the level of cuts. We've tried cutting spending. Governor Dunleavy proposed a significant cuts. None of those uh, survived in, in, in the aggregate. So we're facing this, this budget deficit. The budget deficit's real. We're out of savings. We've got to do something. We've got to find revenues uh, to pay for it. Some proposed PFD cuts, which have the largest adverse impact on Alaska families in the Alaska economy, we need to find other ways of raising the revenue, more equitable, rate, more equitable ways, more uh, lower impact ways on the Alaska economy. We need to find other ways to do that. And that's what all this has been about, is finding those other ways uh, that have a lower impact on Alaska families and have a lower impact on the overall Alaska economy uh, than continuing to rely uh, on PFD cuts. People who, people who say, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't, you can't uh, 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 tax the industry. You can't tax the top 20 percent. They're not being taxed, folks. By the way, PFD cuts do not impact the top 20 percent in in any material in er- any material means. Uh, you can't you can't tax the industry. You can't tax the top 20 percent. The, what they're what they're saying is, well, we got to tax middle and lower income Alaska families in. 
and that has the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy uh, and on Alaska families of, of any of it. I know you don't want. I, I know people who like to say, "Don't tax this, don't tax that." I know you don't want to. I don't know you don't want to admit what you're doing, that you're pushing it to middle and lower income Alaska families. But that's exactly what you're doing. When you say don't tax industry, don't tax the top 20 percent, you're pushing it to middle and lower income Alaska families. You're having the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, and you're having the largest adverse impact on Alaska families. And and I'll keep talking about that until the cows come home. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, AK4SB.com. You can find him on Facebook. You can argue with him there as well if you'd like. Uh, he spends a lot of time on there discussing these things day in and day out. Brad Keithley, thank you so much. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.